Good evening. My name is Leslie Wingo. I am the president and CEO of Sanders Wingo. Thank you for being here this evening. So let's get started. Last January, I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting my friend and colleague, Mark Updegrove. With my passion for equity, inclusion, and diversity, and Mark's incredible leadership of the LBJ Foundation, we began to engage in conversations around race and history and how we can encourage others to be in action to create positive change within our communities. This change he and I both envisioned moved beyond tough conversations and would give people practical solutions in this historic moment of racial justice. Over the last 12 months, with the help and feedback of so many people and organizations in Austin and, in the, sur and the surrounding areas, we are honored to have you join us for the, for the, fifth, of, for the fifth of six, excuse me, virtual conversations on creating a path to racial equity. I would be remiss if I, didn't if I did not think the teams at both the LBJ Foundation, Sanders Wingo, our incredible partners, and of course, each of you for engaging in this critical dialogue and making Central Texas a more equitable place for each of us. One exciting opportunity I would like to share with you is that each of you are invited to continue this conversation with the Central Texas Collective for Racial Equity as they will host the Path to Equity, the after show every Tuesday at six o'clock on Facebook Live. You can sign up and find additional information on Eventbrite. We are about to get started. And as we move through our discussion, I invite each of you to drop in questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Now, it is my honor to introduce this evening's guests who are from Creative Action. And for those of you who are not familiar, Creative Action is an Austin, Texas-based nonprofit arts organization dedicated to inspiring creativity, unlocking potential, and transforming the lives of thousands of students every year. Through a suite of in-school, after-school, and community programs, Creative Action helps students of all ages become creative artists, courageous allies, critical thinkers, and confidence leader, confident leaders. Their creative programs, their team of skilled professional teaching artists help youth, parents, and the community find their voices and stand up to racial injustice through theater, film, and visual arts. And within their organization, they are passionately committed to being an anti-racist organization, dismantling white supremacy and institutionalizing equity, justice and belonging in all aspects of their company. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by Executive Director of Creative Action, Karen Lachelle. Thank you, Karen and the entire team from Creative Action. We're happy to have you. Thank you so much for having us, Leslie. We're really excited to be here tonight. So as Leslie said, my name is Karen Lachelle and I'm the Executive Director of Creative Action. And I use she, her, her pronouns. And I'm sharing my pronouns tonight, as will everyone, uh, as a way to establish an inclusive and respectful environment where, where really everyone will be referred to in whatever way aligns with how they identify. So I'm thrilled that tonight we're joined by a group of incredible Creative Action young people and educators to discuss racial equity and racial justice and talk about how at Creative Action, we really inspire youth and the community to take a stand. At Creative Action, we really believe in the next generation and we know firsthand that young people provide us great hope for the future. So often in history, it really is young people who have helped solve problems, who've helped bridge communities and fight for systemic change. Like youth, like the youth who started a March for Our Lives movement to advocate for gun safety or Greta Thunberg, who's fighting for climate change, or most recently, Amanda Gorman, the youth poet laureate who offered us all visions of hope and unity. Um, those, those all come to mind. But the truth is there are incredible young people brimming with passion and a fight for justice in their hearts in every school. And the more that we really listen to the next generation about what they want, what they feel, what they envision, their lived experiences, the better that we really are. So uh, I'm really pleased tonight to uh, have many of my wonderful colleagues and some of our young people here, and I'd like for them to introduce themselves. So uh, Dawn, would you uh, introduce yourself, please? Good evening. I am Dawn Burnside. I use the pronouns Black woman. Um, I am the Senior Director of Racial Justice and um, re, um, hmm, ra <laughs> Equity, uh, Racial Equity and Social Justice, um, long title at Creative Action. Um, I'm responsible for making sure that each employee is treated equitable. 
Um, and I help create opportunities for black artists. Hi, my name is Natalie Goodnow and I use she, her pronouns. I am a school-based program director at Creative Action and in my role, I direct the programs that take place in schools and during the school day um, on Zoom these days, but of course not under different circumstances. Uh, we also lead uh, teacher professional development and workshops for parents and caregivers so that they can be in the know about all the great things we're doing during the school day. Hi everyone, my name is Mickey Johnson and I use she, her pronouns. I am a 19 year old young black Mexican woman. I was a part of the creative action team programs for all four years of high school and I'm now coming back as an intern. Um, I, right now in my internship, I've been focusing on the power of youth voice and just getting those connections and the communications started. Hi y'all, I'm Luisa Nahar, I use she, her pronouns. I'm 19 and I am an alumni of Creative Action's teen art collective called Color Squad. And currently I'm a first year BFA student at the SMFA at Tufts University in Boston. Thank you guys. Well, thank you for being here for this conversation. So tonight's conversation will be kind of a fishbowl where we'll really talk about creative action and, and tell you a little bit more about how we work and how we're really um, trying to impact the community. And we're going to give you three things that we're really going to focus on that we think um, are essential to allowing the next generation to make our world racially just, safer, and healthier for all. Um, but to really get us started this evening, I want to start with talking to our young people who have been nice enough to, to join us this evening. And I want to hear from each of them and about their journey and, and kind of where they're coming from. So Mickey and Louisa, I know that you are both incredible activists and artists, and you've been a part of creative action programs for many years, creating art that speaks to a variety of social issues. And I know for both of you in your work, you've taken a stand for racial justice. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your lived experiences and why this work is so important to you? Mickey, could, could you start us off here? Totally. Um, so as I said, when I introduced myself, I am a young Black and Mexican woman. Um, so all my life, I've heard stories of how my family has been just mistreated solely for the color of their skin. Uh, my grandfather would have to eat his tacos in the school bathroom because the kids would make fun of him. Or even when my grandma was getting her driver's license, they said, you pass as white. Do you want me to put that down for you so you don't have any troubles? Um, so just my whole life, I've been faced with all of the unjustness of our world. Um, so this work has always been important and I've always wanted to make a change because no one should have to lie about themselves in order to feel safe. Um, so that's just a little bit of why I'm here today and doing what I'm doing. Thanks, Mickey. What about you, Louisa? Yeah, so I kind of, I grew up, I'm, I'm Mexican and I grew up with a brown dad, but I'm very white, very white passing. And so I kind of grew up seeing my, pro with an emphasis on my own privileges versus how he's treated within everyday society. And so I think it, I've always been passionate about um, addressing inequities that I see around me. And I think that's a similar feeling to a lot of young people at this time. So Dawn and Natalie, you're both educators and community activists really fighting for racial justice. Can you tell us a little bit about um, your own journey and how you really came to blend art and activism and youth education all together? Natalie, could you start us off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I grew up doing theater as a young person, and then when I went to college, like a lot of young people, um, I got more politicized. Um, for me, it kind of started with learning about Chicano theater, and that led me to the Chicano movement and Chicano feminism and just kind of a whole world of different social justice issues. And at that point, I got really curious, really like hungry, I would say, uh, to learn more about how what I knew as a theater artist could make a meaningful impact on these kinds of issues. So I started exploring how original works of theater could inspire dialogue about important social issues. And I really sought out just everything I could find that could help me learn how to be a dialogue facilitator and help people who have really different opinions on polarizing issues have generative conversations together. 
And then after I graduated, I started working with Creative Action and um, Creative Action really invests a lot into training their teaching artists. So that's where I really uh, picked up the skills to merge what I was exploring with theater and dialogue facilitation with working with young people and got to learn more about interactive theater programs like Theater of the Oppressed and Theater in Education, the kind of work that uh, we do in the schools. Um, got to learn about more arts mediums, all kinds of things. And then I think the last kind of point on the journey that pretty much brings me up to where I am now is that I got to a point where just having dialogue about social issues didn't feel like enough to me. And I really wanted to feel like I was more involved in making a tangible change. So I started volunteering with uh, different campaigns that were organizing to shut down uh, immigrant, private immigrant detention facilities where the detainees are treated really poorly and just different kinds of campaigns and movements that are about um, stopping mass incarceration and the detention and deportation complex. Um, and what I, and I was really lucky to get to go back to school to kind of explore like how movement building and organizing happens also and read a lot about that too. And of course, it should be no surprise, I learned that all the skills I had been building up to that point in theater, dialogue facilitation, working with youth um, were really vital in that setting too. So that's kind of how I got here and, and what will be in, informing the perspective I'm sharing tonight. Thanks, Natalie. Dawn, I'd love to hear from you and about your, your personal experiences and your journey. Um, much like Natalie, I grew up um, learning about these things. I mean, just living it, right? I grew up in Harlem, um, New York, um, and it's like, it's with the Mecca of Blackness. So it's what it showed, the Harlem Renaissance, it showed everything about fighting for justice it, as not being an option. Um, so just diving deep into that, especially in college, I learned so much about um, where I grew up and how impactful it was for the civil rights movement um, and just using art. And I always had a passion for youth development. So um, working at Creative Action kind of used my passion for youth development, also my fight for social justice to bring it together. Um, and now we call it autism, which is my favorite word. Um, so that's kind of how I got here to do both um, things. So like I said, tonight we, we've thought of really three specific takeaways that we would like to share with you that we think are really useful for people to think about how to advance racial equity and really think about uh, how the next generation can be a real, a real part of that. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is really about talking to young people about race and differences at all ages. We really believe that if we talk to young people about race and racism, even from an early age, that they'll develop the skills, vocabulary, and confidence necessary to really talk about race throughout their whole lives. Because not talking about race and racism doesn't make it go away. It only makes it more difficult to address and dismantle. So we really want to normalize talking about changing our culture and building a racially just world. So let's start off with this topic. Um, Mickey, Tell us a little bit, you know, you're a young person, uh, you're, you, you've just been through school recently, you're just a recent grad. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how did race and racism come up in your home? How was it something that your family you know, addressed and talked about? And, and was that different than kind of what you experienced at school? Totally. Yeah. Um, kind of like what I mentioned before, like, my whole life has been a discussion about race and racism. There's never been a moment where it wasn't relevant to myself or my family. And it was never like, um, it, it was never like, all right, they turned of age, now it's time to have the talk, you know? Uh, you just grow up seeing the injustice. And obviously that starts conversations with your adults nearby. And um, so it's just always been something that I've been aware of at, at, at home. Um, but in school, it was very different. In school, we never spoke about race unless we were learning about slavery and how Black people were enslaved. Um, or unless it was February and it was Black History Month, then we were like a holiday. Um, so school showed a very different kind of perspective. And I want to say that that's the right perspective. Um, it's just a completely different story. If you don't talk about it at home like I did, then you really don't get any knowledge whatsoever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to compare the two. 
Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking about how race was brought up in school and racism specifically. Um, kind of, I feel like racism was definitely taught as a past issue that was solved with the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s when that's clearly not the case. And so um, kind of like borrowing from this, the concept from Michelle Alexander of like preservation through transformation, like, I think there is not like, we weren't taught a lot about systemic racism and how like there are structures in our political socioeconomic systems that enable certain oppressions. And that is just like not taught about. I think it's taught more as like in, in, on the individual level rather than institutional. Don, can you talk a little bit as an educator about why you think it's so important that we really do address race and racism with young people? Yeah. So I believe race is a part of everything. Um, as much as people like to say that it's not and things are not about race, it's a part of everything that happens. Decisions, laws, however things are done in this country is centered around race. Um, so, and unfortunately, Black people, people of color have the, the lesser favorite part of when things are about race. So you have to talk about it because it's not, you can't get away from it. You can't move away from race. You can't run away from it. You can't say that you don't see it because it's a part of every part of life. Um, so it's critical to get them prepared early, right? You have to start talking about it so they can know about it, especially kids of color, so that they can be prepared for things that happen as they move forward in this world. Natalie, do you have any tips for adults in regards to just, you know, how to talk to young people about race and anti-racism? And, and what have you really seen as an educator and as a parent really be effective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, one thing we, we like to share um, with parents and educators in our work is that you, you can, there's, it's never too early. Like you can start this with really young kids. Um, some experts even recommend like starting when kids are infants, because even when they can't understand you, at least you're practicing, you know, so then it'll never feel weird to you. Um, but even with really young kids, you can do things like just helping them notice what's going around them, going on around them, just uh, modeling how you might name it. So even with pre-K kids, uh, you could do something along the lines of when you're reading a picture book together, if there's representations of, you know, diverse folks in the book, talk about, oh, look at all these different skin colors. Isn't that beautiful that people come in so many different colors? Like, oh, which one looks more like my skin? Which one looks more like your skin? Which one looks like chocolate? Which one looks like honey? So just kind of make it fun and playful and remove this weird taboo around it. There's nothing bad about having different skin colors, of course, um, and naming that. And then also really important, that's just a stepping stone in a, in a lot of ways to helping them notice and name the inequities and the injustices that are around them because of course, it's there, as John was speaking to. Um, so this could be things like, oh, have you noticed that when we get our groceries from the grocery store and people are doing, bringing, you know, doing curbside pickup and people are bringing us our groceries, have you noticed that they, the people doing that usually have darker skin? Um, or have you noticed that in a lot of movies, especially older movies, the main characters have lighter skin, they're white, um, things like that. And it doesn't have to all be one big awkward conversation. And actually, it's probably better if it's not, we can just drop in little observations here and there and ask questions, you know, just, uh, oh, who benefits when things are like that? Who's harmed? Do you think that's fair? Why or why not? How do you think that should be? Uh, and also, do you know why that is? Do you know why it came to be? And, and they might not know, but when they express interest, then we can help guide them to kind of developmentally appropriate books, media, things like that. And I think um, it's important too, as they get older, um, like Mickey said, um, in school, there was just a holiday and uh, slavery, right? So black history didn't really just start with slavery and it sure does, doesn't end with that, right? So that needs to be very clear of how we're, you're going about race. Um, Cause it seems, you know, it's very narrow-minded um, and very short stops about what it is. So you have to do your due diligence to go out and find the information um, about race so that you can teach your kids the proper way. Are there any other kind of, you know, must do, don't do sort of things that, you know, anyone else wants to kind of throw in to, to make sure that we share with the audience? 
Yeah, kind of adding to that, um, talk how we were talking about how it's just like a holiday at school. Black History Month, when it was started, it wasn't to be like, all right, February is the only time we will talk about these people. It's It was to reflect on everything that you've learned of everyone, of all colors, from the whole school year. And it's interesting to see how that isn't how we do it now. Um, so my vote is that we go back to its intention. But just to kind of reiterate, like, don't just teach me that my entire dad's side of the family is just slaves. Like, that's not who they are. That's not who we are. And definitely don't teach me that racism is over. Um, that's kind of like a trend that I've seen throughout elementary, middle, high school, that whenever you talk about racism in your social studies class, they talk about like it ended. But it's still very like prevalent and relevant to us today because, I mean, you see it in the news. And oftentimes people... Like people, I know even like some members of my family, we just don't watch the news because it's so saddening. But when you don't watch the news and you don't let yourself see the horrors of the world, then you just kind of act like it's not there, which can also be harmful. But that's just a little bit. Thank you, Mickey. Well, we're going to move on to really our second takeaway for the audience tonight. And the second thing that we really want the to, to convey is how important it really is to listen to young people and and why we really need to center young people's voices in our conversations about race and racism. And this really means listening to them um, talk about their lived experiences and taking it seriously, because the truth is that young people are really the future and they will be the most impacted by social change. And they offer an untarnished passion that can really drive us towards racial justice and racial equity. So uh, thinking about that, you, let, we can all kind of hop in here, but Natalie, you know, tell us a little bit more, like, why is it so important when we're having these conversations about race and racism to really listen to young people and center their voices? Yes. Thanks for your patience. I went, got it, my power went out. I was on my phone's Wi-Fi, but I'm back here. Um, so as we've touched on, young people have the right to weigh in on the the future that we're shaping for them since the decisions we're making now are going to affect them more than us really Um, but also we need to hear from young people i find that people in general young and old tend to listen to messages about social change uh, better when they come from young people i mean young people don't really want to be lectured by adults they tend to hear Uh, things better from other young people. And also for adults, I think that sometimes when a message comes from the mouths of babes, so to speak, uh, we just hear it better. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes I think we we try to be on our best behavior when we know that young people are watching us. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, Natalie. Um, Mickey, I mean, why do as a young person, why do you think it's important that people take you seriously? and, And do you feel like adults do listen to you right now in your life? Um, Well, kind of like what Natalie was saying, I think it's important because like, we haven't been tainted by the horrors of the world yet. Um, We still fight very strongly and feel very passionate about injustice and we can very easily point out when something's not fair. Um, So we haven't we haven't been stuck in a world of just cruelty for so long that we feel like at anything we do won't change it. Um, we, we strongly believe in ourselves um, that we can make this change. Um, so it's important to just kind of, as an, ad- as an adult listening to us or maybe on the verge of listening to us, just to kind of like think to yourself like, okay, hey, they may actually know what they're talking about. Like just because what we say might not be the norm or might be might not be what the tradition is, it doesn't mean that what we're saying doesn't have truth to it. And also like when I know as a young person that um, has lived through mental health and I know a lot of people in my generation are also struggling and fighting against mental health. Um, it A big part of that comes from feeling like where you don't have control over your life. Um, it feels like everyone around you, like you're developing into this young adult. And as soon as you turn 18, everything legal says you're an adult now. Um, 
But unless we're treated like adults, we just feel stuck and we feel like we don't have any control. And that can definitely um, not do some good things for you. Um, So the moment that adults start listening to us, not only are our spirits lifted and we feel like we actually have some self-worth and some self-power and some self-confidence, we also realize, hey, what I think is worth doing and worth saying and worth talking about so it's as an adult you have a lot of power to just kind of honestly to shape us and give us like Mm -hmm. to let us know you can be who you are Um, because there's a lot of people in the world telling us that we can't be so it's important for you as an adult to make sure that we understand that what about you, Louisa? Tell us, like, when, when you find you're in a space where adults are really listening to young people, like, how does that make you feel? How does it change the experience for you? Yeah, I think very similar to what Mickey was touching on, on, like, how it validates our own identities. I think it's really important to include youth voices in the conversations of race and equity and stuff, because that then promotes the idea that Racial, racial justice and injustice is a cross-generational issue and it doesn't just affect adults, it affects all of us. So Don, tell us what are some of the ways that adults can really be sure they are listening to young people and kind of have their pulse on what, what's happening for young people in our communities? Social media, right? Um, That's where those young kids live, right? They have social media brains. um, They make impacts. They write, you know, and they don't just use it for entertainment all the time. They use it for, you know, powerful messages. So you you listen to them on the platforms that they're using. Um, There's another example. I just saw um, a video of a school district in Washington, D.C., where kids went to the school board because they wanted better bathrooms and better school lunch for their school for their school districts. And they did polling and they talked to their peers and they went to that school board and they demanded it. Um, so you have to listen to them. But they did that all through social media. Right. They use what they have. So follow kids, you know, follow influencers. You know, you listen to what they're saying on those platforms. So. The third thing that we we wanted to focus on tonight that uh, we think can be a, a useful strategy for um, a pathway to racial equity uh, is very close to home for all of us at Creative Action because it's very central to really who we are. And that is that we really believe that you should use art, use creativity, use self-expression as strategies to advance racial justice. And we really believe that because we, we know and from from looking back in time that social change most often really does begin with cultural change. And to advance racial equity, we can think about the media that we consume and we can and create uh, as ways to further our conversations about race. We can be intentional about the books we read, the media that we watch, the cultural events that we attend to make sure that we're, you know, really uh, including a diversity of people and that differences are celebrated. And additionally, we can be thoughtful about choosing media that honors the excellence of Black, Indigenous and people of color. So for us, creativity is a really uh, a critical component of, of how we envision um, standing up for racial justice. So Don, I've heard you talk a lot about the history of art and the civil rights movement. We know that you know what we're doing at Creative Action is nothing new and what other organizations are doing is nothing new. So tell us a little bit about how art has impacted the fight for racial justice over the years and, and why art has been such an important tool. I remember waking up on Saturday mornings, my grandmother playing James Brown and Black and I'm Proud, right? So it that was a staple in my household. And that was just a song, but it wasn't just a song. Um, it was about standing up and being proud to be Black, right? Because it wasn't a time where you could always be proud because we were at a block, we lived in a neighborhood where Ronald Reagan said it was the first Black in America, right? So being in that in drugs and all the things and crime was was associated with blackness, right? So that song put a sense of pride inside of my family, um, listening to that. Um, also, you know, writers like County Cullen and, you know, in the Harlem Renaissance, just showing up and using their art forms to make a stand. Maya Angelou, Langston Hughes, you know, books, reading. Um, when reading wasn't thing that we could we should we, we could do, right? Like we couldn't read. Um, so those art forms helped us, you know, take a stand and continue to fight. So art 
it can change the world um, and not just policies, but change how you move to help you continue the fight, right? So we necessarily didn't, we changed policies with civil rights movement, but the artists got the people the power to keep moving um, because of those songs, like I'm Black and I'm Proud, to give you strength and, and power when you just wanted to give up, but you kept moving because you know that you're Black and you're proud. Thank you, Don. Um, are there any shows or, or movies or anything right now that that you've been watching or that you see that you think are we might want to tell the audience about that are, are great to check out that can be inspirational or um, kind of give people yeah. ideas? So my favorite show right now is Blackish. Um, it's on ABC. Um, it's turned around. A, 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 it's almost like a modern day Hustable Hakabi show, right? Um, it's around a, a middle class Black family, but they talk about issues, right? My daughter and I watch that all the time. It's one of her favorite shows as well, and it gives you. A, it, it talks about the history of Blackness. I mean, it's funny, and but it's informative, right? So that's one thing that we use a lot. Um, we're actually reading this new book. Um, we're going to use um, at our new um, at our Black History Kids Day at the Carver Museum, Els um, Els Mirror written by Babu Blake's son, um, Elijah. So we're going to use that. We're going to use those books, right? We're going to, um, there's some, Malcolm X is a powerful movie, right? Um, so those are some things that you can, you know, watch. Um, like I said, social media, there's a tons of things that's out there that we can, you know, use. Um, and a lot of things are free now. So there's no reason to not be able to see things because we're in a pandemic. You can watch movies, past movies, and, you know, read books that you weren't, you didn't have time to read before. Thanks, Don. So Louisa, you're an incredible artist and you're an activist and you have been a part of so many really cool projects through your murals and your own personal artwork that I've been able to see, which has been incredible. Could you tell us about a specific project that you've worked on that really does address race and, and issues around racism and, and why you think your art was really the, the strategy that you wanted to use to address it? Yeah, so um, I think art, you know, it has the power to inspire and it has the power to change the normalities of our society. And I think a lot of the times or our normal, what we perceive as normal is white. And so I think that's why art has such a powerful, um, it's such a powerful part of inciting in racial change as well. And so I think one of my um, murals I did a few years ago with Creative Action and Color Squad was on Catalpa Street in the east side of Austin. And I'm pretty sure everyone's pretty familiar that the east side is going through some major gentrification for like the past 20 or 15 years. And so in this mural, what we really wanted to focus on was celebrating the um, historically Black and Latinx community that was there, and but also presenting them in that community in the present and in the future of that community as well. And so, yeah, I think art has is just really great at um, kind of breaking down seemingly like complex or overwhelming um, like parts of our world and um, injustices and making them a more consumable um, thing to take on. Mickey, tell us a little bit about what you what you're doing right now, and what you're working on, and how you're really um, standing up for racial justice through your art, through your activism, and, and what you're up to. Uh, definitely. Um, so uh, I believe it was 2019. Um, I can't believe that was like two, three yeah. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but Noah and Stephanie from Creative Action they told me about the National Guild for Com Community Arts Education and how they throw an annual um, National Young Artist Summit. Um, now, for the first two years, it was in person. And for my first year, it was in person. But this past year, it was digital, like what we're doing now. Um, and basically, what that is, is a summit for only young people. Um, I think our age range was 14 to 24. Um, and it's where just young artists gather and celebrate each other and celebrate their work and showcase their work. Um, and just be like, hey, this is my art. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I'm doing. And oftentimes, like a lot of what we got was art using, was art being used for activism. And that wasn't in our parameters. It's just what everyone's doing and what everyone's passionate about. And this past year's summit was called um, Young Art Revolution, something along that. Um, it was like a revolution. 
Um, and it was really interesting to see just how everyone came and everyone, like I have never seen a response as big and as passionate as it was. And this is from across the nation and everyone, and it wasn't just the young people, it was their parents, it was their adult accomplices. Everyone was just saying, how can we be involved? How can we make sure this runs how we want it to go? Because this is so important to ourselves and we know it's gonna be really important for our audience. So um, if you wanna check that out, anyone watching, um, that's another way that you can kind of, I've been looking at the chat and these questions, um, but that's another way just to kind of get started is by looking at the National Young Artist Summit and just looking at your community organizations, like how creative action is for us. Thanks, Mickey. So Natalie, tell us, you know, a little bit more about art as a, as why, you know, a strategy you use and kind of the thing you, you go to as you're trying to really impact racial justice and racial equity. Yeah, absolutely. I have a lot of thoughts on this question, so I'm going to try to run through it pretty quickly. But as we've mentioned, cultural change, the first step towards broader social and political change, we can't convince people to, to make a big change in how we do things in the world if we can't imagine it first and communicate it in an understandable way, like um, Louisa was talking about, but also in an inspiring and compelling way that really touches our hearts and captures our imaginations. Um, art heals, it helps us heal from the effects of oppression. It helps us overcome fear, find courage, find strength. Um, reminds me of what Don was speaking to. Um, Art experiences help us build community in a really powerful way, which is so important because no one ever makes big revolutionary changes alone. Uh, it also gives us a space to rehearse for the world that we want to make together and kind of try out some different ways of being together and try to see what, what do they really look like, sound like, feel like. We can put them in our body and even try acting them out um, in theater, of course. Um, and also, I, I think I'm not seeing different types of change as, um, so, as as being so separate as I did at one point. Um, but even in like what some people think of as the real change, like the marches and the rallies and the sit-ins and protests and those kinds of things, even in those kinds of situations, um, bringing the artist tools to that work really makes them more effective. Because if you've plans this big protest and you're only going to get a few little news clips or a few photographs in the news, we want to make sure those photographs or these clips are really, you know, sharing the message or trying to get across effectively. And so if we kind of think of the whole action with some aesthetics in mind, we can do that so much more powerfully. Um, and lastly, uh, a point that I think is really relevant to our focus at Creative Action and our focus today is that the arts, is, they're an outlet that is always accessible to young people. I think many young people who want to make an impact on the world sometimes wonder, you know, if I can't vote, if I don't have a bank account, if my parents don't really want me out marching because it's not safe, like what can I really do? But the arts are always available to young people um, and they're actually a really uniquely powerful way to make a change, especially coming from young people. So that's something we really need to help make the world into the one that young people deserve. Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> well, Don, Louisa, Mickey, any of you, do you have any other final thoughts or anything else you, you'd like to share um, before we move into our Q&A section of, the, of tonight's event? I definitely do. I Let's hear it. Want to say, okay. Um, kind of also talking to like artivism and using art for activism and just all of that. I mean, I never thought about it. Like for a while, I just did art because it makes you feel good, you know? Um, it's a way to express yourself. Um, but like if you look around and like look at the cultural changes and just social changes that's happening, art is always there. Like there is not like one movement that has not used art, even going back like decades. Like people have used um, their language and poetry and songs to ignite change. And I mean, back in like during the Women's March, we had those hats, like that's a form of art too. Or even like during the presidential races, you wear your buttons and you have these like posters done by artists. Um, so art is really everywhere if you look for it. So um, just as an artist yourself, um, don't 
don't say that like what you do can't be used for this if it's something that you're interested in because even like a simple instagram post of like a little doodle can start someone thinking like it's all about like getting the conversation going um but yeah i I wanted to share that (laughs) and that should be taught in schools i mean that should be taught in schools that's how you teach kid about race (laughs) thank you don So we're going to take some questions from the audience. We have a a first question, and that is, if a young person wanted to get involved in making art to stand up for racial justice, how could they get started? And I'm just going to throw this out there and let any of our panelists take the the question. How could a young person get started today? I mean, I would say just do it. You know, just do whatever feels natural comes to you and how it works. And then, you know, keep going. You just have to start. Exactly. Yeah. Even if like I was a part of the theater program. So like even theater and like something that seemed as just entertainment or even music, like no form of art can't be used for change. So just find what you enjoy doing and figure out what message or what uh, like movement you're passionate about and then just see what comes naturally to you. Okay, we have another question. Um, How do we work to bring in individuals into the movement who are not necessarily interested in change and they don't really see racial injustice as a problem and are comfortable with their socioeconomic status and privilege? So how do we bring those folks in? I think I I have some (laughs) thoughts about that. Um, One thought I have is to not expect it to be quick and don't expect it to be a one-time conversation and an overnight change. Um, And I've found some ideas from the world of of deep canvassing uh, inspirational and helpful for me. Um, And I can try to summarize them, but you you should probably like Google deep canvassing to try to get a better summary of it. Um, But some of the first steps are um, asking them about their perspective and really listening really listening thoughtfully and intentionally, um, active listening, which could be really hard for you. (laughs) So you might need to kind of like psych yourself up, have a buddy who you can debrief with afterwards. Um, And then also let them know like, well, I think about it differently and this is why, and just explain your point of view. And when you do that, uh, don't rely too heavily on facts and figures. Like sure, you can bring in a few data points or whatever, but but don't make that the main part of your argument, like really connect with them as an individual and talk about how this affects you as an individual. And hopefully this is someone you have a relationship with and they, they care about you as an individual. Um, and then thank them for having the conversation and go to your debrief buddy and, and scream if you need to, if it was hard for you. <laughs> and also don't like, don't spring it on them. Like kind of, you know, no, don't confront them at the dinner table in front of everybody, like set it up ahead of time. Like, hey, is there a time when we could both kind of hear each other out on where we're coming from on this? I would also say use resources like Undoing Racism or Beyond Diversity. Um, those trainings really, I, I saw some transformation happen in both of those trainings for people who were not even thinking about it. Um, so use your resources. Also, just real quick, um, this made me think to our power, privilege and oppression workshop. And the question that like always comes up is like, how do I deal with people when they're being like difficult like that? And something we would always say is like, ask them why they think that way. Like go right down to like the core of the discussion and the problem if that's what's happening. And oftentimes when you make people think about why they're so comfortable in their privilege or why they don't see the oppression that's happening, then they start to connect the dots. Thank you guys. Um, We kind of touched on this a little bit, but I think there might be some, you know, even more specificity. We have a question, you know, at what age should a child be able to start the conversation about racial equity? It's never too early. You can just take it way down. Um, Like my son is three and uh, I do point out the the colors of skin in the books we read, and um, and I 
talk about the colors of skin in the movies and TV show we're watching. And I try to not bring too much like heavy emotion to it and just be like, did you notice that in Toy Story, almost all the characters have light skin? That's silly. That's so silly. They should make movies where they show everybody, like you and me and daddy and people with darker skin, all colors. I think that's what they should do. And then we just kind of move on because he's three. He doesn't have much attention span for it, but <laughs> just try to do it kind of on a regular basis. Um, and I did that kind of stuff when he was, you know, like one and two. I don't know that he really fully understood what I was saying, but it doesn't hurt to for, you know, you as a, a parent or caregiver or educator to get in the habit of doing it. Um, okay, so how can our educational institutions remove implicit bias in our curriculum, especially in early childhood development? It's a, it's a big question. What are some, uh, what are some ways? Trainings, courageous conversation about race, um, you know, really taking the time to train your teachers to, to understand history, to really, um, understand that there is a bias. I guess you got to start there, right? Um, and understand that curriculum is not fair. There is no equity in education. Um, so start with changing curriculum, knowing that it's not designed for all kids and knowing that all kids don't think differently. I mean, do, do think differently. So, you know, understanding that you have differences in, in culturally and, you know, educational levels. So there's so many steps to take. Um, but you got to start out by knowing that there is some. You have to you have to start out by knowing that there's no equity in education. Right. Thank you, Don. Um, okay, we're going to go on to another question. Um, and if anyone thinks of anything for these other questions as we go, we can certainly kind of jump around a little bit. But this might be a good question for look for Mickey and Louisa. Um, the question is. Do you have any recommendations for social media influencers to follow? Like, is there anybody that you are, you like to follow that you think is inspirational or educational or can kind of help, help in our, our pursuit of racial equity? Let me look up some people I'm following yeah. and I'll like drop them in the chat. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. That's a great idea. Yeah, and if we oh. and also we can follow up after this too. I know we were going to put together some resources of other organizations <laughs> that also use art as a strategy for, for standing up for racial justice. Um, Dawn, did you have, do you have any ideas or Natalie for particular social media, uh, people on Instagram, TikTok, et cetera, to follow that uh, can be inspirational? Somebody just dropped in the chat, Amanda Gorman, which is a great one. Yeah. Um, I think we talked to, oh, there's more ideas in the chat. Yeah, y'all check out the chat. It's, it's got lots of good stuff Thank going on. Thank you, chat, for helping us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Greta, Greta Thunberg posts funny things. Um, I feel like Dawn might be more savvy with social media than me, so I'm going to pass it off to you. <laughs> well, I think it's wherever you are, right? So, because my stuff might not be for where you are, right? So whoever you're into, yes, Michelle Obama, um, you know, whoever, you know, Stacey Adams, whoever you're interested in where you are, you got to follow because, you know, my following might be, taste might be not the same as everybody else. And also just like, look at your For You page on TikTok. I mean, so many people like TikTok has brought just normal kids to to the spotlight and like we said like we have things to say and they're saying it so if you see that someone's like they said a funny joke or did a funny dance then look at their page and see just kind of flip through because I don't think there's one person that I follow that haven't said something like haven't been someone to listen to um, and like that being said, also, it made me think about when we were asked about the age to start talking about uh, race. Um, there's also this question that often comes up. It's like, at what age should we take youth seriously? And I know we were talking about like turning 18 and when we start being considered adults, but that's not that's there's no number for when you should take kids seriously. Um, if there's a five year old, that's. I don't know, doing an interpretive dance about the, the news, then listen to that kid. Like you don't, this is my favorite thing to say, but you don't pay your plumber because they're some 45 year old person. You pay your plumber because they fixed your pipes. So you, if they're saying it, 
it doesn't matter their age, just listen to them. Thank you, Mickey. I like that. Um, it sounds like the folks who are watching can't necessarily see the chat. So I'll just kind of shout out a few of these that have shown up for some different social media folks to follow. Um, Rachel Cargill, Layla Said, and Laine Vani. So um, I'm, I'm sure there's a place we can continue to post these afterwards, but those are a few that just kind of popped up. All right, we have another question. This one I think is really interesting. So why are adults so afraid to talk to their children about race? Why is it such a big, scary conversation for so many adults to talk to their kids? What do you guys think? Can I answer as a youth? Yeah, yeah please. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's because it's uncomfortable. The nation and whether that be the powers that be, the whatever it is, we have made race something uncomfortable to talk about. Well, that shouldn't be a thing. Like race, ra racism shouldn't be a thing within itself. But because it is, people with privilege, and I mean, I know I have some privilege myself, and even I have like uncomfy feelings when we talk about serious topics. Um, but it's just, if you're uncomfortable, then you should probably talk to about it. Like, if you feel that, then know you're doing what you should be doing. Because honestly, that that's just how it is at this point in time. But yeah, I think that's why it is like, I mean, any serious conversation is uncomfortable. And as a human, I think we tend to steer away from that feeling. Yeah, I think um, sometimes people think if they acknowledge race, then that in itself is racist. And I hope we've just made it clear tonight that's not the case. It's, it's actually anti-racist to go ahead and acknowledge race and the impact it's had on our lives so we can do something about it. Uh, and I think also, um, particularly for folks caring for young people of color, we have a lot of our own baggage around it and we have a lot of painful memories and it can be really hard to think about ushering the young people we love so much into a world that is prepared to be so cruel to them. Um, so sometimes we have to really work through some of our own baggage. Um, I think and, and maybe I should just shift to eye language because I feel like I know perfectly well. This is something my my son needs for me to be able to navigate the challenges that he faces in his life. But um, and, you know, now we're at a point where we're critically analyzing Toy Story, what have you. But <laughs> but I really did have to kind of push through some stuff and like learn some new coping mechanisms of deep breathing and stuff to just work through the grief and the fear and the rage that I had. Um, I just saw someone comment on the chat. They don't want to mess up their kids. Um, but I think you're, you do your kids a disservice if you don't talk about race um, because then they learn it in other places and then you're not prepared for the conversations, not prepared for the emotions. You're not prepared for anything and neither are they. So you have to get past yourself and talk about it um, and how you want to, you know, to, how do you want to navigate the conversation um, and all you, how you want them to hear it outside if you don't talk about it. And one thing yeah. I would, oh, you go, Mickey. Okay. okay. Um, and just coming from my own experience, like my parents censored a lot as a kid. And a lot of that was fruitful and it was a good thing because when you're young, some things are just too hard to know is happening. Like you don't want to go to sleep every night knowing that there's like real bad guys out there. You want that to be some fantasy world. Um, but at a certain point, censorship, as you can see in the media, becomes bad. So you just like, as a parent, and I say this because I'm a big sister to three younger brothers. Um, and so I just see that being a sister, that there's a lot of things that I'm like, I don't want you to know that yet. Like, why do you know this? Like, no. Um, but also I have to think about my life and just for them, like, am I doing them a disservice? Are we doing them a disservice by not letting them know the truth of just the harsh parts of the world? Like, yeah, the world is great. The world is beautiful. So if you're wondering, like, should I tell them these bad things? Just make sure you balance it out with all the good things, too. Oh, Mickey, you read my mind. That was exactly yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah, when we do dip into those rough things, like, we can build our capacity to face hard things by really 
experiencing and cultivating as much joy as we possibly can. And, and yes, we need to share stories of racial injustice, but we also need to share stories of Black, Indigenous, and people of color's resilience and beauty and joy and just boost that, like pump up the volume on that as much as possible. Yeah, I Thanks agree. That's why that. that that Black and I'm Proud song really does, you know, kind of, you know, it stuck in my mind for so long because it made me feel proud of being Black and not as the media looking at TV would make me feel like I'm ashamed or I'm, you know, less than. So you have to find joy. Well, speaking of joy and hope and, and kind of some of the more positive things, I mean, what are some things that you see going on in the Austin area right now that give you a sense of hope and joy for that, you know, for our area and, and kind of moving in a more positive direction? Is there anything that you've seen that makes you feel hopeful and good? Honestly, just right now in the chat, um, I don't know if we can call out who said it, but someone said that their 10 year old daughter is listening in too. Like what? That's amazing. Like, that's why I was like, like, thank you so much for that. That's awesome. It makes me so happy. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. There's and, some. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. No, it's okay. Don't you go. <laughs> well, there's some amazing organizations um, in Austin that's doing some stuff like Six Square. Um, mm. They're doing some amazing things in the community. Um, Austin Justice Coalition. You know, you just there's some things that's happening that is um, bringing joy and, and greatness to the Black community. So you just have to look out and see what's happening. But there is joy um, there. You have to follow it. Yeah, I was just going to say creative action. I mean, <laughs> it's been so great in like giving me the tools to like start addressing these ish these topics and like, I don't know, finding my own voice like as an artist and combining that with like other parts of my identity as well and like not knowing like figuring out that those it doesn't have to all be separate parts of my life and I don't know I've just been completely grateful for what creative action has done for me as a young person going into this world. Well, we're grateful for you, Louisa, and for you, Mickey, and for you, Don, and for you, Natalie, and for all of the vulnerability and passion and insight and wisdom that you bring every day to all of our work um, as well as tonight. I hope it's been a really um, great conversation for everyone out there to hear and kind of listen in on. I know that it was it was wonderful for me to just get a chance to talk to everybody about these topics and for us to really think about how we can be intentional um, with the way that we in, engage young people in topics around racial justice and include them as we, as we stand up. Um, we are going to wrap up for this evening. Um, I know there is a post-show um, opportunity to uh, kind of continue the conversation, and I think the link is is out there. Um, please visit Creative Action's website. We have a lot of really incredible uh, programs that are going on that teens can get involved in, uh, that families can participate in. Um, Don's hosting an incredible Black History Month event in a few weeks. We have a music and movement event. We have all kinds of really cool things that you can use to uh, engage young people in learning more about racial justice and how to stand up. So thank you so much.